can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the question tonight is whether organised religion inevitably ends up being intolerant and harmful and wicked. And what was the word? Um, intolerant and uh, hatred. Thank you. Hatred and intolerance. Thank you. Uh, I want to tackle that question by asking a more fundamental question, which is why are religions so powerful in the first place? And the way that I like to think of this is to use the theory of memes or memetics. Uh, if I'm going to do that, is there anybody here who doesn't know what memes is? And please, oh, and please be honest. Okay, a few. So a quick recap. The idea of memes comes out of universal Darwinism. Memes are any information passed around in culture, copied from person to person. So they, um, although they're very different from genes, they're undergoing the same Darwinian process. So for example, um, would, would you just stand up here for a moment? Here we have a beautiful t-shirt that says, Think Week, this is, I mean, this information has been copied um, again and again. There's been the printer, there's been the person who wrote it in the first place, there's been the, the idea of t-shirts, the way they're made, and somebody has chosen this. So you've got the three fundamental processes that you need in any Darwinian process, copying with variation and selection. The selection was presumably somebody said, should we have red or blue, and they ended up with blue. And so we've got the same processes going on in culture. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> when you look at everything around us, the chairs, the way the lecture theatres constructed, the rucksacks, all these things around us, you look at them <clears throat> as being the survivors in a vast competitive process of memes competing to use human brains and human technology to get themselves passed on and copied again. All the stuff we see around us is the survivors, and all the things we don't see around us are ideas that, you know, books that didn't sell, uh, articles that didn't get published, um, clothes that <clears throat> somebody wore once and everyone said that's rubbish and they threw it away, uh, whatever it might be, they just disappear. The same as, you know, the trees around us are the ones that survive. So, when you think this way, then you have to ask the question, well, wh which are the memes that survive and which are the ones that die out? You can take fundamental evolutionary um, things like fidelity, fecundity, longevity. In other words, the memes that survive are going to be those that are accurately copied, of which many copies are made, and the copies last a long time. So, you know, books are better than conversations and so on. Internet, fantastic means of increasing fidelity, fecundity, and longevity all at once. Um, but it's been a long process getting that. But you can also think of it in terms of why we, <clears throat> I call us, well, we're mean machines, or we are selective imitation devices. That's what our brains are doing all the time. They're deciding which memes am I going to remember of all the ones bombarding me all day, and of those few, which ones am I going to pass on to anybody else? It's selection at many stages. So I think the reason we choose certain memes and take them on and spread them, it can it's be like a continuum, really. At one end are the ones that we choose and we go on spreading because they genuinely are good or true or beautiful or useful or in some way for our benefit, or for society's benefit, for other people's benefit. And then at the other end of the continuum, there are the viral memes that are really, I mean, all memes are selfish memes in this way of thinking about the world, but these ones are nothing but selfish, and they trick us into copying them. And of course, you can think of things like um, email viruses. Do you remember those dreadful ones in the early days where they would say, um, uh, warning, warning, pass this on to all your friends. If you, click, if you do this, if you open this, um, your, everything on your hard drive will be destroyed. And you go, oh, panic, panic, must tell all my friends. Now, that has tricked you. How? Very clever. One, fear. You don't want everything on your hard drive wiped out. Two, altruism. You want to help your friends. You, know, you don't want them to have their hard drives wiped out. Um, and uh, three, you don't count the cost. It's easy and neat enough to click, send it to everybody, and you don't actually realise that there's a carbon cost, there's a clogging up networks cost, and there's a cost in your time and the time of your friends who's sending it to. But you, you forget. I hope you can see where I'm going. It was Richard Dawkins who invented the term meme, who calls uh, religions viruses of the mind. Now, some of you may know, I've disputed with him to some extent about this. If you have this continuum, <coughs> I would say he says that religions are right at the very end and they're entirely viral, and I would say, well, actually, you know, they're somewhere in here. Um, because 
they have a kind of big mixture and have some things that are not entirely viral mixed up with them. But I utterly agree with him about the structure. The great faiths of the world all have the same fundamental structure as an email virus. That is, a copy me instruction backed up with threats and promises. So if you take Islam or Christianity, you can see there, you are brought up in that faith. Uh, as I was brought up in Christianity, I was confirmed, I went to classes, you're taught all this stuff and you're told not only to remember it, but to repeat it out loud, other people can hear it, to pass it on, spread the good news of Jesus, and blah, 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 blah. Um, in, in some faiths, you are actually taught that if you don't do that, you will, uh, terrible things will happen to you. And the threats and promises, of course. Well, you know, if you're good and you pass these things on and you remember them all and you sing them and everything else, you go to heaven and it's all absolutely wonderful forever and ever and ever. And, you know, in Islam, you have streams flowing with milk and honey and virgins and gibbons and whatever else. That's probably a mistranslation, but certainly, you know, wonderful sexual exploits. Um, and uh, in Christianity, I don't know why no one's, this theory is weakened by the fact that no one's yet invented a religion where you've got, you know, infinite broadband when you get there. Um, but do the punishment, oh, oh, well, you've got pitchforks and sulfurous fumes and burning in hell and agony forever and ever. Even worse than losing everything on your hard drive. Or is it? I'm not sure. But these things, the structure works. People are frightened enough, and they don't count the cost. And what is the cost of belonging to one of the great faiths in the world? A lot of time. Now, the benefits there are social benefits. There are health benefits. There are benefits to your genes in the sense that religious people have more children. But in terms of the time devoted and the money devoted, and a lot of that money goes to um, building up the priesthood, building the buildings, and so on. But that's just the structure. Unfortunately, I think religions use a lot of other tricks, which are really very scary, which email viruses and you know, chain letters don't use. One, for example, I would call the beauty trick. There is no doubt at all, and I'm afraid not in this, I was joking, well, half joking, about I'd rather be in a beautiful room down in Magdalene. Um <laughs> religiously inspired, you know, this is not religiously inspiring, but you go, well, you go down around all those college, um, um, uh, chapels, and you will be inspired by the fantastic music and the wonderful stained glass and everything. But it's genuinely beautiful. Why do I call it a beauty trick? Because when you go in there, the stained glass is depicting man being tortured on a cross or Virgin Mary or, or whatever it might be. So you kind of pay for your beauty by being uh, 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 um, presented with these memes. Um, but even more worrying, I think, is the altruism trick. See, most religions, and certainly the great faiths claim that you are a better person, a more altruistic person, a more compassionate person, or a more wise person if you belong to this religion. And why do I say that's a trick? I think it's like this. The memes that thrive are ones, not always, but one of the ways they thrive is because they piggyback on our basically evolved genetic nature. We, are, as humans, are evolved as a social species Kin selection makes us be loving and, and kind and generous towards our own family and our own children. Reciprocal altruism makes us be friendly and kind and generous towards people who are kind and generous and friendly to us. We also gain brownie points by being nice and being seen to be nice. So we have this deep inbuilt desire, A, to be seen as a nice person, and B, to really be a nice person, because that's the best way to be seen to be a nice person. Now, if the religions genuinely made people more kind and compassionate and, um, uh, and loving, that would be fine. But the evidence so far, and it's only in recent years people have been looking at this closely, <laughs> suggests that it's simply not true. A recent study comparing volunteering, community involvement, charitable giving, and various other measures of altruism showed that atheists and uh, religious believers uh, were about the same. In fact, in the latest one, the atheists came out slightly ahead, but it, it's basically the same. I think the difference is that people who belong to a religion that claims these things attribute their kindness to their religion. And the people, the atheists, don't. They just say, I just wanted to be kind, or I just wanted to give money because I get upset about the thought of people being abused as ch children, I want to help, or you know, whatever it might be, and don't attribute to religion. In that sense, it's a horrible trick. 
Now, um, how does this, let, having set the scene, let me come back to our question. I want you to think about religions not as um, great mean plexes that were constructed by God, not even great mean plexes that were constructed by people, although in some sense they were, but as mean plexes that are survivors in thousands of years of competition between other mean plexes. So you see in, in Hinduism, in Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism, different sects, different flowerings of different ideas, and then they die off in another one. And the ones that we have around us today, just like the flowers or the trees or the rats or whatever else, are the ones that have come through. And they are the ones with the qualities that have suited them to, in their ecological niche. So they've used all these tricks, but one of the things that they have to do is they, they piggyback on human nature. And as we know from looking at uh, kin selection and reciprocal altruism, it's very natural for us to be kinder to the people close to us and horrible to other people. This is something which we try to overcome. Now, you are from an organization promoting compassion and wisdom without getting into, you know, are there any ultimate goods? Surely these are good things. And therefore, to strive towards those means to some extent going against the human nature that is, well, I'll be nice to my friends and my family, but everyone else can go to hell. But, you know, you look at um, the Quran or the Old Testament, and it's full of in-group friendship and out-group hostility. Is this inevitable? Because I'm trying to come back now to the question about the inevitability of it. I can imagine a religion that is truly about enlarging the realm of compassion to all. And you do get claims like that. You get them in Buddhism. You get them in, in other religions too. But mimetically, the memes that go for that awful human nature that says, yeah, my friend's fine, but the other gang I'm going to kill, will have some kind of advantage. Maybe we can over that, overcome that. Maybe we will, but take another thing. A religion, think of it as a mean plex. Think of it like an organism, if you like. Um, one that has good boundaries, keeps all the ideas pure, passed on with high fidelity within it, keeps people stuck within it, gives punishments for leaving, and in that sense is protected. That will thrive over an open religion that is truly tolerant and says, well, other people are perfectly fine to believe different things. It's perfectly fine to leave this, this religion if you don't like it. It's perfectly fine not to argue with other people. Be tolerant. In a romantic sense, that will not thrive against the ones with the good boundaries, with the solid teaching, with the punishments and the threats um, and the promises. That's the foundation for intolerance, for saying I'm right and you're wrong. And it's part of the process that I think you can see playing out in the uh, competition between different religious new places. So, if the question is, can organized religion, is organized religion inevitably going to lead to um, hatred and intolerance? I can imagine it not doing so. I can hope it not doing so. But my own arguments lead me to believe reluctantly that it is inevitable. Secular Society. It's been around since 1866. I'm not the first executive director, I hasten to add, but I have been here for 15 years. Uh, and I'll tie into one thing that Sue said earlier that I, I suppose I am proud of, which is that I think I'm the only person uh, to have gone to the United Nations and uh, raised the issue of child abuse and the uh, Holy Seas, as they call it. Um, breaking uh, articles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in respect of child abuse. Um, and I've done it three times now. And the last time I did it was uh, in March last year. 
um, I was able to say that that uh, the, 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 the points that I had made about this uh, these breachings um, had been uh, now verified um, by Jeffrey Robertson QC, who's a special juror to the United Nations, um, who's uh, quite agrees with me that there are six articles that have been broken on a wholesale level. Could you pass me the watch, please? That's right. And uh, and also perhaps this, just the end of my uh, of my introduction, I might say that um, talking about religious hatred, um, I rather felt um, a week ago on Friday when we won the High Court uh, judicial review that uh, made unlawful prayers being said during council meetings. Uh, I did rather feel, certainly looking at the uh, newspaper headlines and some of the things that were said in the uh, in the electronic media, that I might well be one of the most uh, hated men in the country. What was interesting about that, though, and that was very much organised religion speaking, was that uh, if you looked at the uh, readers' comments uh, and even the right-wing, quite extreme newspapers, they were very much more in our favour. So that was uninstitutional institutional religion talking, perhaps. But really, I think the bar has been set very high uh, with, this, uh, with, with this motion. Um, and I have to say, I'm rather more addressing myself to uh, the more that religion is institutionalized, the more it leads to hatred and intolerance. And I hope you'll forgive me for that. I think the bar of inevitably too if it's pretty wishy-washy institutionalized religion, as it say is in uh, uh, in, the, in the Nordic countries, sort of Denmark, Sweden, etc., then uh, that clearly it demonstrably isn't the case, and I wouldn't want to uh, to suggest that it was. And this isn't an attack on religious people. Um, lots of them do a great deal of good, and indeed, a lot of uh, religious institutions do a great deal of good. But uh, nevertheless, I think uh, there is a lot of truth. Uh, in, in the propositions, and one only needs to look at the uh, the theocracies uh, to to demonstrate that. I mean, if we take Iran, you know, the um, that uh, haven of human rights and tolerance, um, that uh, I think rather uh, rather makes the point, and it's not the only one. I mean, I would say that the more theocratic a country was, the worse their human rights. And my goodness, that's a lot more true than it isn't. Um, I, if I look at the examples around the world apart from that, where I, I see major examples of hatred and intolerance, I mean, I, I think it's inevitable that one has to say there's a great deal of Muslim, mainly on Christian violence, uh, taking place around the world. Um, and and I, I was debating that with the speaker's chaplain. Rose Wilkins the other day, and she said, oh, it's just stupid people. Well, maybe it is stupid people, I don't disagree with that. But uh, the fact is that uh, if you look at the objective reports on, on religious violence, I'm even for once, I'm actually quoting a report from the Vatican uh, that I think is actually quite even-handed. Uh, that uh, it's just astonishing that a very high proportion of, of, uh, of violence against religious people, in particular Christians, is actually coming from other religions rather than nasty atheists and aggressive secularists. <clears throat> uh, as it seems to be mandatory to uh, have to put a, a pejorative adjective between before atheist and secularist for some reason. That's certainly something I've discovered in the last uh, week if I didn't know it before. So there's an awful lot of that going on in the world. Um, Places like in Nigeria, in particular, where there's a kind of encroaching Islam on, on top of what was a democracy and a broadly Christian country, uh, where there's great attempts to actually impose Islam, not just on Muslims, but uh, very religious laws being imposed on, on those who aren't. And obviously, that's the very antithesis of secularism and the very antithesis of tolerance. The other thing I find quite uh, worrying too is the attitude to homosexuality in Africa, which I think uh, has been informed by uh, our, uh, whether imperially or, or, or of origin, imperial in its origin or not, I don't know, but certainly the, uh, 
uh, anti-homosexual uh, pronouncements in, uh, in fundamental Christianity. And that's actually starting to pull the worldwide Anglican communion apart. But at the level of the, of the uh, intolerance and, 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 and its murderous uh, strength is, is, uh, is uh, and the scale on which it is, is absolutely quite, quite dreadful. And I suppose historically one of the groups, uh, certainly in Europe, that has been uh, the subject of, of the most um, hatred has been Jews. And you do wonder whether the origin of that is very much in the Christian idea of he killed Jesus and the blood libels and these kind of things. Um, and uh, you just see in so many places in Europe the, just the extent of, and, and the centuries over which that intolerance is, uh, has occurred and it's just in the ghettos and just, just absolutely dreadful. But before we feel too comfortable about this country and there aren't any problems and there haven't been any problems, there are actually historically some quite uh, difficult examples of, of the mainly established church um, in, in, in the way that it acted when it had the power and the ability to do so. And fundamentally, uh, I'm entirely agreeing with, with uh, the previous speaker, of course, that it is often about power. And the, if you've got the power, you take it. And the religion often has huge power. And if it becomes the established religion, it has even more power too. And there's a kind of uh, pact between the rulers and the church to kind of each bolster the other. And it's, uh, to the disadvantage of everybody else. And so, of course, we've had quite a quite shameful uh, history of the, uh, of, the, of the Tests and Corporation Acts, where you couldn't get uh, uh, any public office unless you happened to uh, be a, uh, a communicant of, of, the, of the Anglican Church. So the nonconformists and the, the Catholics had, had a terrible time, wasn't it, until 1828 that that largely got sorted out. And even quite late into the 19th century, before it got remotely civilised, the um, Bradlaugh, uh, the founder of the National Secular Society, uh, was involved in a dreadful fracas in Parliament in, 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 the 19, in the 1880s, where he was uh, elected for Northampton, tried to take his seat, and they wouldn't let him take it because they wouldn't let him uh, take the oath because they knew he was an atheist. So his seat was uh, was was dissolved or whatever, and uh, the by-election and this whole process iterated four times, and he got very angry. And at one point, he was imprisoned in the tower underneath Big Bad, and he actually at one moment tried to administer the oath to himself in frustration, and they wouldn't let him do that. And eventually, I think they realised after the good electors of Northampton had returned him uh, for the fifth time, that kind of uh, <laughs> it was getting a bit boring. So he managed to get his seat, and to his honour, he uh, he was responsible uh, responsible for the Oath Act 1880, which allowed um, uh, affirmations, uh, which of course are now much more commonplace. Um, also, of course, the church wasn't. Uh, exerted its power very much in Oxford and Cambridge and the, the many religious universities where uh, um, certainly attendance at chapel was uh, uh, was mandatory until not so long, not many decades ago and I suspect also that uh, in some cases you actually had to be a, communi a communicant Anglican to come here at all which from modern day eyes seems absolutely unreasonable so, I also think that we need to look at our language, as I was mentioning earlier. I think we are very uh, unreasonable about the way that it seems to be fine to say whatever you like about religion. Uh, the, the religious people can be as fervent as they wish and don't expect to be uh, criticised. And yet, there seems to be a new intolerance of, of, of people who don't believe, or secularists, as I was saying, this sort of mandatory pejorative adjective, which is in the, very much uh, in, in, in the press. And that in itself is a sort of intolerance. And, uh, and, and certainly from my experience recently, 
a, a kind of hatred that I, I found from the um, massive publicity that, uh, that we've had uh, over, over this case. And it was very interesting to see how, well, after the, 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 the verdict or the, the hearing, the uh, court decided uh, in our favour, how, how this uh, sort of balloon of, uh, of publicity uh, sort of came in, in with the, the right-wing papers in particular being so absolutely vicious and, and, and the government coming in behind, uh, behind the church and saying this is a Christian country and you know, all we've done was to go to a, a court of the land to say what does the law says and I was actually accused of being totalitarian, how by blimey, how totalitarian can you be to actually go to the court peacefully and ask what the law says. That was the kind of language that's, that's being used. I think that's hateful in the circumstances. Um, and so uh, then you get the government coming in, particularly the most uh, uh, charming community secretary, Mr. Pickles, saying, you know, this is a Christian country. So it's not going to be okay for Muslim prayers or Hindu prayers or anything else. You know, you wonder, you know, why he's paid to say that and whether that's reasonable. I mean, he is a very strong evangelical Christian. Um, and I worry about this intolerance and, and how it, it doesn't even seem to be possible to be able to conduct public life without religion being involved. I, that was the whole purpose of, uh, of, our, uh, of our court action. Um, and, and it was extraordinary how this developed into the place of religion in public life. I'm, I'm delighted to see, to, to see the, uh, at least it kick-started a debate that was rather over, overdue. But then I wasn't expecting for us to, uh, for, for Her Britannic Majesty to actually get involved. And uh, I must say that really did Because <laughs> she actually came up and said, you know, that the Church of England is, is terribly misunderstood and um, we're here for inclusivity. And I'm thinking, I wonder whether she remembered those oaths that she said in uh, 60 years ago about uh, upholding the Protestant faith and the Church of England and all that kind of thing, which is the exact opposite, of course, of inclusivity. But uh, that's obviously that what the, uh, the established church has realized is its only hope as church attendance is in terminal and uh, steep decline that they've got to join with the others uh, to uh, really against the, uh, the, the unbelievers at the gate. So I hope that I have uh, given you a, enough examples um, to, to show um, that the, the more religion is institutionalized, the more it leads to hatred and intolerance. Thank you. Sometimes of hatred. 
So I thought it was an intriguing metaphor that Sue used about of memes. And the idea of memes originally comes from the Greek word mimestai, to imitate. You can imitate all sorts of things. You can imitate good things, you can imitate bad things. Sue chose to look at the metaphor of email and email viruses. And insofar as what she said, it was true. But I think if we're really looking at the breadth of true religion and true culture, we're not just looking at the viruses, we're looking at all the other wonderful human communication we have, which enables us to connect to other people. That's the origin of religion, of religio, to connect. And it would be so wrong to just look at the aberrant, the virus, and not to look at what the real truth is, what the, what the beneficial and what the, um, what the more valuable um, and more um, the communication of real integrity, real connection, and above all, I would say, real empathy. But at its best, religion is about expanding empathy. We have empathy to those we most love, to our friends, our family, sometimes our parents, if we've been brought up well, sometimes not if we haven't, to our community around us. But why not extend this? There's a wonderful book by Rose McCauley, The Towers of Trebizond, and I recommend anyone to read it. And she talks about the ideas of nation and the narrowness of, of nationalism and the terrible way that nationalism, maybe backed by religion, maybe not, can inculcate negative values and hold people in bondage. And then she says, but why not extend the boundary? Why should the boundary stop with family, with friends, with community, with village, with nation? Why shouldn't it be wider? Why shouldn't it extend out to the reach of empathy towards the whole world, and not just those living at the moment, but the world of those who will live in the future. So, where do we see this true religion? I would see it in a Christian tradition, not confined to the Christian tradition, as in hearing in the Sermon on the Mount. A sense of the importance of loving not just our friends, but our empathy, but our, but our neighbors, and a willingness to Take a stand, even at the risk of losing our own power, even at the risk of losing our own lives. And for me, one of the shining examples of Christianity in the last century was that of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who in the 1930s said, in facing the quintessential, and I will use the term, the quintessential evil of the National Socialist regime, was prepared to say, the church must not simply bandage the victims under the wheel, but jam the spoke in the wheel itself. And it was the strength of that living tradition which he came from that enabled him to connect to people of all faiths and people of none, and to stand up to the hysteria of the Nazi regime. And I think it's extraordinarily moving. If anyone wants to read one of the most um, wonderful books inspired by religion, I would recommend them to go to Bonhoeffer's prison notebooks, which are about his reflections in jail, his letters to the woman he was in love with but could never marry. He died a Flossenburg at, um, at um, he died a martyr at Flossenburg. But his extraordinary capacity to maintain a vision of love and of empathy, even towards those who imprisoned him. And at the end of his life, he was able to not only um, celebrate with those who are of his own faith, not only with those of the extraordinary loyalty that he showed to the Jewish community, but also celebrated with um, communists and those who held no religious faith, but nevertheless felt they wanted to celebrate a shared meal together. Okay, um, I'm wondering what more I can say. Um, I can say a little bit about the Quaker community and a little about the Quaker movement. The Quaker movement grows from the 17th century, a time of huge turmoil in the English Civil War. And in the early expression of religious faith rooted on the individual conscience of each of us and the capacity of each of us to know God, not through priest, not through minister, but through our own personal knowledge and in communion with friends, worshipping in a shared silence. Those early Quakers 
had a vision of human rights which, which involved a, the, a claim to the franchise for all, the rights of women, the opposition to capital punishment, the opposition to the reform of the House of Lords, a support for decent housing for all, the belief that everyone had a right to play a part in the, in the polity at the time. And these values are 350 years before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When we look at the values that enable us to meet here and, and debate today, they are the values that come through a Christian tradition. A Christian tradition that fosters the values of the Enlightenment, and it's part of that that's the precursors of our friends from the humanists and from the National Secular Society. Interestingly, as a matter of history, the humanists grew out of the ethical societies and the union of ethical societies in the late 19th century, which themselves came out of Unitarianism. And I was fascinated to hear um, Keith talking about Charles Bradlaugh um, and his problems in, in, in swearing in Parliament. One of the people who actually was one of his greatest supporters was John Bright, mm -hmm. the Quaker MP who had himself faced some of those difficulties, difficulties previously. So, I'm wondering what more I should say. Um, does, it, does religion inevitably lead to intolerance? No. May it lead to intolerance sometimes? Yes. I would say the real danger is authoritarianism. Yeah. The, the kind of deep, deep-rooted, almost, um, I don't want to say flaw, but the deep-rooted root human capacity to be cowed by others and not to trust our own truth. It's something that Orwell writes about immensely powerfully in many of his novels, including, including 1984. <coughs> And that may be manipulated by many forms of ideology. Some of them may be and will be religious. Others aren't. If you look at the oppression in the 20th century, I would say that certainly there was religious oppression. Certainly there was religious oppression in countries like Spain and the fascists in Spain. But if you really look at the, the worst and most egregious, the most awful form of tyranny, it was probably the, it was undoubtedly the um, Nazi disease that spread across Europe, and also strongly the form of Marxism interpreted by Stalin. And I'm not here standing as anti-Marxist, because one of the most wonderful things that Bruce Kent, who himself sees himself as a Catholic every bit as much as the Pope, it's not the Pope who has the, the right to say who's a Catholic and who's not, he said, have you ever thought of the idea of Karl Marx as somehow being a Jewish prophet, with or someone who had all the characteristics of a Jewish prophet without the language of God? And I think what that brings me back to is a sense of trying to see both in ourselves what is most true and where we find the examples of what's most true in others. And I think there's perhaps two distinct traditions of religion. There's, this goes right back into the Old Testament there's a prophetic tradition, a powerful tradition, that talks about, for instance, as in Micah, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And that has always been there alongside people who will seek to manipulate religious power to their own ends. Now, I've got five minutes left, so I think rather than say anything more, I would just like you to think that... Um, for me, true religion is really about building up and informing and encouraging, nurturing people's consciences. And Thoreau at Walden, in his writings on civil disobedience, talks not just about religion, but about secular power, of the danger of democracy as appealing to authoritarianism. But the real democracy we don't yet see would not be raising the group above the individual, but seeing the individual as the individual conscience, as that which should be at the heart of our polity. Now, I don't wish to appear anti-Catholic. I think it's absolutely appalling what has been done and what has happened within the context of the religious power that is wielded by the Catholic Church. 
But I am also heartened by the words of Cardinal Newman. Maybe he was an Anglican rather than a Catholic. I think some Catholics don't ever really see him as having become a, a full Roman Catholic. He said this, if I were to bring religion into after-dinner speaking, I would raise a glass to the Holy Father, certainly, but to conscience first, and the Holy Father second. And I hope that in looking at this question in, in an intelligent debate, when we are quiet, that we will see context as being all. charity called the Foundation for Developing Compassion and Wisdom. And wow, I'm the fourth speaker. <laughs> it's getting a bit late in the evening. So I'd like to invite you all to participate in something a little bit different for the beginning of my 10 minutes or so. And this is something entirely scientific. In fact, it's something being developed here in Oxford. And entirely secular, entirely neutral. But obviously it's your choice whether you want to or not. <coughs> Um, is there anyone here who's been to a 7-Eleven grocery store? <coughs> a few people, okay. Well, this one is called 7-Eleven Breathing, right? And it's a short exercise that takes just a few moments. So if you'd like to participate, that's great. Um, if you want to observe, then you're welcome to observe. But I think you'll get more out of it if you choose to participate. Um, and to start with, the request is just to put your feet as firm as you can on the ground so that you're getting a little bit of balance in your body. And to make your spine as straight as possible. I mean, people don't really completely understand what's going on in the nervous column, but at least it gives a bit of space for energy to flow up and down. Put your hands comfortably in your lap, on your leg, on your knees, whatever's comfortable for you. And all we're going to do is just slightly adjust something that we do all day long, which is to breathe. So we're each individually going to breathe in to the count of seven and out to the count of 11. And we're just gonna do that three times. If you want to make it harder for yourself, you can try and think of nothing else except for the breath going in and out as you do it. It's counting lightly. That's the kind of extra bit of the exercise. So we'll just do it starting Do it once, and then do it a second time. And the third time. Thank you very much. Somebody got the giggles, that's not unusual. <laughs> Somebody else maybe is feeling a little bit sleepy. Um, probably mixed reactions to that. I mean, maybe it was nice to have a moment of peace and quiet, change from all the talking, the ideas going on. And I mean, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's plenty of it going on, and give you details about it happening in Oxford as well. And maybe other people are asking, why on earth did she make us do that? Huh? <laughs> a few minutes lost in this busy, stimulating evening. And the reason I did it is because it is really, um, there's three things that I'd like to extrapolate from that short experience and talk about. Um, I think we've all been stretching the motion a little bit, and I'm going to stretch it a little bit more, whereas really what I'd like to think about is the relationship of religion with intolerance and hatred, and that's where I'm going with the time that I've got. So, the first thing of what we just did, the most outstanding characteristic maybe, was the quiet. And I think that's one thing that religion offers people. Not necessarily very obviously, but it offers people a break. With the rushing to and fro 
rhythm, the racing after objects and things like that, and gives people just a little bit of space. And there's actually quite a lot of it going on, but it's not very visible for obvious reasons. So a lot of religious practice is silent and it is solitary. And it can be very helpful having that alternative to endless talk, endless interaction, and endless motion. And just one thing I'd like to say is don't judge religion necessarily by the loudest voices. What's happening on the public stage may not be the main point. Maybe that's not the main action. The second thing about what we just did was that it was a technique. It was a tool or a technique. Technique for getting insight for personal transformation. And that's where I first got involved in religion in a big way. I was actually an atheist when I was here at Oxford. I had nothing to do with church, chapel, or anything else. But around my mid-twenties, I got involved with a project, emergency project for homeless people. And I found myself observing quite an interesting phenomenon, which is that I really wanted to help people. I saw the people around me doing that. But we kind of hit an altruism barrier. We got to a certain point in stretching ourselves, and then suddenly there was a kickback, and we were kind of taking it back underneath the table. So we were being terribly kind and helpful, but we were getting self-importance out of it, or we were getting um, pride. We were getting, I could just see, you know, a slightly corrosive edge coming in. So my question to myself was, how can I extend my altruism? I can see there's extraordinary people in the world who seem to be able to behave in the most unselfish way. Why can't I do that? And if that's my ambition, if that's what I'm really interested in doing, how can I learn it? And on that basis, I brought a single to Delhi, and I was actually out in Asia for over one and a half years, having the most interesting time. And in, in religious situations, among Christians, among Hindus, among Buddhists, and also in completely non-religious situations. And I was in search of tools and techniques, and advice, and role models. And I found them. I found the most amazing techniques. I mean, we were talking earlier, um, Sue was talking about this thing of the altruism trick. I actually found altruism tools, which was what I was looking for. That's exactly what I wanted. And a lot of them were experiential, so they're quite hard to just explain. You can't necessarily read them on a piece of paper. But they're things that when you practice and when you do them every day, they're habits. I mean, the Dalai Lama refers to prayer as familiarization. You know, just deepening yourself, deepening your commitment to something. Um, there's all kinds of techniques for developing forgiveness and things like that. And a lot of them are actually still taught and still covered within the religious traditions. Not necessarily very obvious from the inside. And I said some of this stuff is happening very, very quietly. You could almost say some of the most sincere stuff is happening very quietly. And there's a book on the edge of the table there by the Dalai Lama published last month called Beyond Religion. And actually, it's a book here that probably a lot of people might be in, a lot of people here might be interested in, because what he's saying is. This stuff doesn't have to stay within the religious traditions. You don't have to be religious to be spiritual. You don't need to be religious to develop these basic human qualities. Let's get them out of the religious silo. But nevertheless, at the moment, a lot of them are there. And my experience, just personal experience, was that there are a lot of people quietly practicing them and people from whom you can learn. So I don't think we're stuck. You know, I don't think this is just um, copy me based up by slights and promises, I think it's actually an incredible portfolio of tools and techniques that if we want, we can choose to use. So, the third thing about that little exercise was that it was actually about the potential of the mind. The fact that when we're peaceful, our minds are more open, they're more flexible, all sorts of possibilities. When we're very tight and when we're very angry, then we see the world in a different way. I mean, one example is you walk into a room and there's two people laughing together. And you project on that. You can say, oh, how great those people are having a good time, they're friends of mine. 
Or if you're feeling neurotic that day, oh my God, I've walked in and are they laughing about me? Is that what's going on? Or it could be, well, it's all right for some, I'm having this terrible time, I'm working so hard, I'm blah, 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 and those people are having a good time. We project. It all comes through the prism of the mind. So it is absolutely vital that we develop this confidence that we can actually change the mind and that we can work for ourselves and we can transform ourselves. And it's a confidence based in science, neuroplasticity, for example. You know, this is not just religious territory. But as Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. We need to find ways of working with our consciousness. If we live with disturbing emotions, if we live with anger and fear and jealousy and things like that, they'll find an object. It's not necessarily rational. So, for example, you have this entire phenomenon of the offenderati, you know, on Twitter or whatever, where you know somebody says something and everybody rises and gets angry and upset about it, not necessarily because they were thinking about that issue, but because the emotions are there and they're finding an object to pin them on. So it is absolutely vital that as individuals, as building blocks of society, we find ways to work with our minds and to develop our positive qualities. And we can see immediately the effect that we have when that, the effect that we have when that, when that happens. You know, I, I live in London. If I go to the tube in the morning and I'm grumpy with a guy selling tickets, and he's more likely to be grumpy with somebody else, and the whole thing knocks on. It's a huge knock-on effect. Each of us has more power and influence than we can possibly imagine degrees of separation. So how do we find a way to do that? And personally, I believe very much more in the individual building block and the change that that brings than in generalizations and talks about structure and stuff like that. Because my personal experience for my life is the effect that individuals have had on me, especially individuals who have developed really strong qualities like loyalty, kindness, humility, courage, all those kinds of things. So there was a reference earlier, I think it was Mike, who talked about sort of almost good religion and bad religion. <laughs> and I mean, I think you could go as far as to say that if somebody is not practicing patience or not practicing kindness, I would say from the tradition that I come from, Buddhism, well, then actually, they're not practicing Buddhism. <laughs> you know, we can, we can label, oh, Buddhism or Buddhist like that, but actually the truth is in the pudding, it's in the act, not in the label. So it's very easy to lay, to lay a great label on a religion based on the people that you can see who are making these really loud noises and stomping around, like the jihadists or something like that, and maybe that's not what it's about, that's not where the real action is. And we're just generalizing on the people who are there in the press, the easiest to hang on to. It's not where it's really happening. I was director of a Buddhist center for nearly 10 years, and people would come to the center and expect us all, well, first they'd expect us all to be wearing sort of coral colored robes and bare feet and stuff like that, or white. I don't know why people expect people, religious people to wear white. Um, and then they'd expect us to be incredibly calm. I mean, when I first said to people I've got an interest in Buddhism, they fell about laughing because I'm not the calm person. I'm not your natural stereotype of a Buddhist. So if you come to the Buddhist center, and all the normal sort of stuff's happening. And people would say, well, you know, where's the difference? Where's the proof? Where's, I want to know what's going on. And I would just laugh and say, well, it's work in progress. The thing that unites us is that we're all working on things together. So I'd just like to finish with a very short story. It's from a Jesuit priest called Anthony de Mello, who was in India, Pune, who's inspired me a lot. And he talks about good religion and bad religion in terms of a small child that had to walk home through the woods with a talisman. Oh, sorry, walked home through the woods and was terrified of ghosts in the wood. And the mother gave the child a talisman and said, if you hold this talisman when you walk through the woods, you will be all right. And Anthony de Mello said, bad religion teaches the child to hold on to the talisman and believe in it. And good religion teaches the child that there weren't any ghosts in the wood in the first place. Thank you very much.
Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, would any of the speakers like to pick up on each other or um, do you have any issues with each other to start off with? Um, you should be microphones, you should be able to speak. Uh, yes, I'd, I'll have issues with everybody. Good. <laughs> I think the Bradlaw story, it was a bit stronger than that. He actually refused, he was supposed to swear on the Bible and he refused to do so. It wasn't just that they knew he was atheist. He actually refused to do so. And they said, well, you can't be made an enemy unless you do. And that's what happened three times until finally. <coughs> so it's actually a bit, a bit more strong and a bit less biased on that part than it was that you um, What I particularly like to pick up from, from both the speakers who were supposed to be on the other side is the way I'm hearing both of what they said, the question was, does organized religion inevitably lead to intolerance? Now, <coughs> you could say that Quakerism is an organized religion, but... Pretty disorganized. It's exactly, exactly my point. It's not that organized, and it doesn't have a heavy priesthood, and it doesn't have all those structures and hierarchies, and it's not frankly as successful as Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, because... It depends how you define view, success. Well, in, 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 in numbers and so on. No, no, I'm defining it purely in terms of, of, of looking at it from a means point of view because it's it's nice and it's not so heavily structured and it's not so authoritarian. That kind of makes my point about the means that thrive and the, the sad power of those kinds of organized religions. The more organized they get, the more hierarchical and so on, um, the, the, the more they compete, out-compete things like, like uh, Quakerism. And what you were saying, was, Alison, was just, uh, you, you did put it in a religious context, but really a lot of what you were saying was, there are practices out there to make us, help us encourage wisdom, become more compassionate, and they don't have to have anything to do with religion. I would just go a bit further and say, let's actually get rid of the religion, because those practices, like I meditate every day, and I feel that that is very helpful and beneficial, and I keep on doing it, and not sure exactly why, but I do keep on doing it. And that's not in a religious context at all. I, I think you missed a main theme what I was saying, which is that actually at the moment, I think the religions hold a lot of that with They do that indeed. They, and it should be let out to, to be I think, out the I, I think I think there could be a transitional process that you have to be terribly careful mm. not to lose the baby with the Bible. Yes, and, and that's, and that's what the Dalai Lama is arguing in this book. My major teacher arguing beyond religions. <laughs> um, I don't see success certainly in terms of numbers, whether of Quakers or any other in any other religion. I think there may be a sense in which we haven't sufficiently identified as a as a group, our terms of what we mean by institutional religion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that maybe we can do in a wider discussion. I don't think institutional religion certainly mean, necessarily means established religion, but I think there is a really interesting question there about when you see something like the role of the Anglican Church in public life in this country, and I'm hoping that a lot of people will be able to go to listen to <coughs> Rowan Williams talking with um, Dawkin tomorrow. I think there's, there's actually something very complex there, but in one sense, if you look at institutional Christianity, in some ways you could say, in this country, and I do think context is all, it wouldn't be the same in, in I can think of examples that would go the other way, I think it's more like Keith's example of the Scandinavian established churches, but paradoxically the established church is probably far more liberal than, for instance, what would be seen as a fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, which would very much um, feel probably even more uncomfortable about the idea of establishment than, um, than, 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 than Keith might. I think it's an interesting question to explore. I don't have any answers, but it'd be really interesting to hear from other people in the, in, in the lecture theater, I think. Mm. Uh, Yes, I think that uh, I'd like to pay quite a compliment to, to uh, the Quakers in that uh, certainly I think if there were a much higher proportion of Quakers in, in the UK, I don't think I'd have a job at all. Uh, so, uh, but, and, it, and it's because it's about the, the much greater influence of the emphasis on the individual. So it, 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 it in itself almost by definition moves away from 
uh, institutionalization. Uh, and therefore, you don't get the formation of the power blocks that, are, that I find uh, tend to be so troublesome and are the, uh, uh, one of the reasons behind uh, secularism, the need for secularism. And um, I, I think uh, I mean, it's quite difficult to, uh, to disagree with, with anything that's been said really on that. I think the nearest I got to it was was over Bonhoeffer, and, and uh, uh, I do it with great sensitivity because obviously the, cir the circumstances were, were quite dreadful and the way that he behaved was exemplary. It's only just analysing uh, what was behind what he did and, and may well have been Christian, but did it have to be Christian and it, could it have been like that if it hadn't been Christian? Um, and uh, I, I'm not long back <coughs> from... from been to Poland and Auschwitz <coughs> and uh, Krakow, uh, and I, I, it's just uh, beyond language to discover to, to describe uh, how one felt about that. So though somehow it was actually so awful, it was actually difficult to engage with it emotionally. Um, uh, it's quite dreadful. But um, I almost found worse than going to, in emotional terms, going to see the camps, is actually going to the factory of Oskar Schindler, of Schindler's List, where you actually saw his office and, uh, and saw some of the uh, examples of what had happened in Kharkov and to the Jews and, 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 and you know, pictures of people there and, and, uh, and, and the signs on the tram saying no Jews and, and um, and somehow one could connect with that on a more human level. But Schindler was no uh, no saint. Uh, I don't really think he was religious at all. And yet I don't think there are many people who wouldn't say that he had done something very, very wonderful. Um, and he didn't have any uh, expectation of heaven and he didn't... Uh, do it for a religious motive. He, uh, he was actually quite a scoundrel or a rascal, anyway, or a lovable rogue. Uh, and yet, uh, what he did and the per personal cost was just uh, was just huge. And so, uh, I'm just saying that humanity doesn't have to be religiously motivated. And I'm sure you wouldn't really say that it was. And the the, the von Hofer example, therefore, is is, uh, it is uh, still stands. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Um, surprisingly enough, I'm not going to let you get away with it that easily, um, because you um, you all take well, for starters, it's quite telling that we couldn't find um, the Catholic or um, the Church of England person to stand up and defend institutionalised religion. Um, and obviously, the Quakers um, probably are the biggest religious superpower in the world right now. You might be, you might be in the future. Um, however, he's had a, a lot of trouble recently. He's been accused of being a militant sectionalist and all this sort of thing. Um, and most of what he does is against institutionalised religion. So I wanted to ask um, Adam and Michael whether you support the NSS. Do you support their work? Do, um, do you have opinions on faith schools, for example? Do you have opinions on um, playing in <coughs> council meetings? Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm thinking about this. I've been thinking about it a lot this week. Um, and I've got mixed views, frankly. There are points in the NSS agenda which I feel comfortable about, and there's points that I absolutely wouldn't relate to at all. So, I mean, and you're going to tell us which are on which side. <laughs> <laughs> it would take probably quite a long time to do so. Well, some I think, extreme examples on both sides of where we're very good and we're very bad. <laughs> I didn't and say view. that, that's your language. Um, I think the Faith Schools one is a very interesting one. Um, I think. Um, Faith school, there is one Buddhist school in Europe. <laughs> Happens to be Brighton, it's a primary school. And so um, I visited it. I think it's a great school. There's some tremendous stuff going on there. That is one division of what schools have been. There are also schools, as we know, the schools that are immensely wealthy and very upper class, the schools that are very expensive, but not, you know, all these different divisions. 
So I would like to see a mix of all those schools and close to them all those schools. And I would love to see the um, headmaster say, or the headmistress of a faith school say, now I want you to prove that you've never been to church because we've still got that quota to fill. So, you know, that's an example of where I would engage with some of this. Um, Keith, give me something you think I'll disagree with. Well, indeed, what about the council prayer box? Yeah. Tom, is it, uh, All the 26 bishops. Oh, well, I, okay, I would like to see the bishops augmented by leaders from other religious traditions and potentially humans as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, the National Secular Society and Secularism. I think it's different types of secularism. I would see myself as being a secularist, or I would see myself as being secular in that I think that the state should be separate from religion. And I also think the state should, part of the role of the state, and I'd be quite close to um, a United States understanding on this, I think, should be to ensure a level, le letting a level playing field between faiths and, importantly, um, those not of faith or those of non-religious belief. Um, in relation to prayers in council chambers, I think the judgment was based on the fact that the statutory power under which the meetings were taking place um, did not allow faith to be part of it. Well, you know, that's a strict interpretation of statutory powers, and that is what the judges seek to do, to apply the law impartially. I think it's a very different question from whether or not there should be prayers in the House of Commons, because it's um, it's a different it's a different it's a different a different legal question arises. That's a legal rather than a moral question. In fact, as in so many of these cases, they're constructed and had both sides wanted to have a compromise, there could have been a compromise of having prayers before the council assembled. But and that wasn't what. But it was the compromise that we offered. Yeah, well, and was no, rejected. Well, no, yeah. then, then in which case, I I, I really don't see any problem with that. Bishops in the House of Lords, um, I, I think I feel two different ways about this. I think it was fantastic that the bishops stood up to this wretched government we've got at the moment and were prepared to represent decent, empathic feeling far more than the conservative liberal democrat coalition has done and to defend the welfare state against a really unpleasant ideology of state at the moment. So I applaud them on that. But do I think that there should be people, anyone in the House of Lords, simply by virtue of their office? No, I don't think just by virtue of being a bishop, by virtue of being a lord, by, vir by virtue of birth, that's the most shocking one of all, or by virtue of being a law lord. One should have a place in the legislature. So I think, as a Democrat, the only second chamber I can see the justification <coughs> for is one based on a universal franchise. And if on that franchise religious leaders stand, fine. If on that franchise secularists stand, fine. But I would hope that you would find people of all forms of different religious, spiritual, and human motivation standing there with a um, willingness to represent not just their own strain of belief, religion, or thought, but that of everyone, because that's what democracy is about. Well, you've picked three wonderful examples there. Um, as for the House of Lords, I think it's appalling if the bishops are there, and I think it would be even more appalling to have people of other faiths. They just should have nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, is election the right way? I mean, you know, I, I, I find myself against some arguments being really pleased that we have a monarchy, because by birth, that queen is incorruptible. But you have an elected, uh, because she's just, I mean, what could you possibly give her that she got? Nothing. You, have, you elect something. She's already got it all. Exactly, exactly. So we have a head of state who doesn't really have any power, who takes all that kind of human, natural kind of glorification stuff right out of party politics, out of money, out of uh, abuse of power. And I feel a bit the same about the House of Lords. I don't have a solution to the problem, but I do think we shouldn't have religion being part of it. Um, now, the, I want to move quickly to the other three things. Faith schools, utter abomination. <laughs> utter abomination. Because what they are doing is allowing the parents even more power 
to infect their children with the religion of their choice and not give them a way out. So I think what I've seen of my, of my own children, now I was brought up in a, a Church of England school, and I, you know, I don't think it did me much harm, but perhaps I'm just like someone who said, oh, my father beat me and I'm all right. Um, I think actually it did, I think it was fine. I think it was very nice, really. But what was wonderful when my children were growing up, because they had compulsory religious education, and they came home from school with their friends, age six, seven, eight, nine, all the way through, saying things like, oh, we learned about the Sikhs this week, and do you know they believe this? And, oh, do you know they have to wear turbans? And, oh, we learned about Islam this week, and they have this book that says blah, 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 blah. And the god of so-and-so thinks this, and this god's the other way. And, you know, even little kids and not terribly bright kids will, you know, it just gives them the view that religion is like history or geography or something else. It's something you learn about. You can believe this or not believe it. It's not something that you have to emotionally cling to. And this is very interesting with respect to the difference between our country, which has a state religion upheld by the Queen, and the United States of America, which is a secularist, secular state, and has the, the, the secularists there kind of uh, glorify the, the woman who made it impossible to have religious education in school. And I'm sure she did it for the best of motives. But I believe that the result of that is that American children are much more open to indoctrination by their children, and they do not get comparative religion, and they do not get the attitude that British children get, that religion is something to learn about, and something if you want to, you can go and choose from all the selection that you've got. So these are just some of the reasons you may have seen threaded through my answers there, why I am not really a secularist in the sense that Keith is, and I'm not a signed up supporter of the secular society, because actually, I think we're better off having the peculiar, ignored kind of um, muddling along in a very British way of having a state religion, but actually, yeah, believe it. You just <laughs> <laughs> well, I think after I wasn't going to intervene, but I think uh, given, given, yeah. given, given given the negative plug, I think I uh, I think I'm going to be graceless and actually do a plug and just say why I think it's important. I mean, I do believe that, uh, uh, particularly with the rise of uh, militant minority religions, and indeed, I think both the Anglican and the Catholic Church are getting much more aggressive uh, as their numbers, numbers diminish, if, even if that's just because it's the moderate people who walk away, and my goodness, in what numbers. Um, but I do believe that, uh, that secularism, after global warming and global terrorism, uh, are, is probably one of the most important things that I appeal to you all to support because I believe that it underpins and will increasingly under, uh, underpin uh, the democracy and Western values that are so precious and that we let go at our, uh, at our <coughs> peril. And I was actually quite angry just recently I was at, the, at the debate at the European uh, Institute of Policy Studies, right in the centre of, of Brussels, where there was a debate about uh, about Islam and, and probably not, but more I should have said about Sharia, and having and, and it was actually an English professor making the case. Well, we've got Sharia here; it's from Leicester, and 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 bring it on. And and this 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 uh, uh, group of academics and lawyers were there in the audience all nodding sagely and wasn't this wonderful and it took me and right in the center of brussels to say we've spent 50 years building up this wonderful jurisprudence <coughs> of human rights legislation and you <coughs> seem to be prepared to discard it like a like an old toy uh, and it's the envy of the world and shame on you and the idea that people who happen to defend themselves as Muslims should be subject to this law is an abomination. A lot of them actually came to this country to get away from that sort of thing. And the idea that there's a kind of cuddly Western or a European Sharia that's really nice and doesn't have the nasty bits is, is naive bon beyond belief. The very previous night, I'd actually been at a debate in the House of Commons, not in the chamber itself, but in the committee room, where we've been talking about much the same thing. The people who were supporting the Sharia perspective uh, were asked from the floor, well, would you agree with stoning in this country? And they said, oh, no, of course not. And then there was a supplementary question. 
And this was a representative. This wasn't just somebody off the floor. This was somebody who came to represent Islam and said, well, what would you think about stoning in, in, in uh, uh, Iran? Well, that's what they do there. Not even, unfortunately, that's what they do there. It's, that's what they do there. And, and you know, it's, well, you know, what's the problem? What, what a silly question. And, and those are the sort of reasons, and freedom of expression, why you, I plead with you to really, really fight for, for secularism and freedom of expression. I gave up a job, quite a high-flying job, 15 years ago because I thought it was important. Now I think it's 10 times as important. And so if you'd like to support us, you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs>
work-related attribute. There are difficulties with it, though, in that whereas, whereas some areas, such as religion, and particularly in um, the Abrahamic, in, in Christianity, are very well constitutionalized, other areas, such as if you're looking at Hinduism, are very poorly constitutionalized. It wouldn't be quite so clear how you could elect those groups. And I think it also does create real problems with how you would choose to represent people who are, in a sense, agnostic. But it is a thoughtful suggestion, and it is one that has been, has been considered recently. Can, can I just add to that, very briefly, that uh, uh, I spend perhaps more time in the House of Lords than I'd like to, uh, and my impression very definitely is that even if you take the bishops out, or the bishops bench out, the proportion of, of, of religious people, uh, and not just Christians, in the House of Lords, partly because of the age profile, is very, very high. And I don't think you need to augment it at all. And I think all religions are already represented in there in the sense that there are people from those religions. And I think it's something quite difficult about putting religion at the top of the pile about people's representation. There are lots of other reasons why we should want people to be in there. Um, and, and it was Professor Ian McLean uh, who actually worked out if you were trying to get some kind of sex and religion balance in the House of Lords, that the size that it would have to be would be three times what it is now. And it's just basically mathematically impossible. And you'd, in doing so, you'd lose out on an awful lot of other things. So I'm afraid, uh, just, just on a mathematical basis, it just doesn't work, but religion's doing very nicely, even without the bishops. Fantastic. Um, anybody else got questions? Uh, I'm going to take the guy up here. Oh, okay. in the uh, I think I've got enough. I'll be on the point. point. Thank you. Um, I don't know where to start. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm a Muslim. I don't know how many people are Muslim here in this uh, audience. And I, there are so many comments in, in my mind now that I thought of just sharing it with you. Um, I agree that religion is a powerful idea and it can control people's minds. And it can be easily used to advance certain people's causes and, and political interests. And examples of it so much you know, like international terrorism or committed by Muslims or the inquisition of the church throughout the Eastern and Middle East, or even the Trinity dogma itself, uh, if you search through the history, it was you know, mm -hmm. uh, created or established by the Emperor Constantine. Um, but I would like <coughs> to say that I'm, I'm a normal man, I'm not a scholar in Islam or anything, in fact I'm, I'm a doctor, so in a, in a way I'm a scientist by nature. And I'm open and very flexible to all sorts of arguments. And by being here, uh, it's just an example of I would like to listen to people's minds and different opinions. And it enriches my experience. Uh, I've read the entire Quran so many times in my life. As part of my school, school education outside, I wasn't, I wasn't living in Europe. And as part of my own you know, personal journey to understand Islam. And uh, I never reach any point in, in, in the Quran itself in its entirety where it promotes inequality or, or intolerance or in a, a, a hatred towards others. Um, I, I, I probably I can, I know my comments are very long, I can, I can probably just sit quiet now and say anything, but uh, you can leave it for questions, but yeah, by all means. Probably I have also read the Quran, not in in Arabic, not in its original, but I've read English translations, and there are horrible things in it. Horrible things about women. There are things about uh, killing the infidel. There's terrible things to be done to people who reject the faith, to apostates. You know, there is, it is. There is. There are things like that. I'm more than happy to discuss them with you, and I don't think that you've read the right. Well, people say this. People say that I've read a bad translation, and maybe I should read another. In the crisis of Islam, just to say one word, is actually to prove it. Islam as a religion, not the practice of Islam, but yeah. probably a lot of Muslims nowadays. Uh, and it's, it's not that needs to prove itself in fact or in the labor by saying, yeah. oh, Islam is a religion, and religion. Then most of the terrorism is now coming from Muslims. It is a crisis within Islam. 
And by all means, I can, I can speak to your word. I know Muslims, as I know Christians, who just reject certain parts of the Quran. They say, oh, well, you know. Um, and they, they take the good bits, the nice, peaceful bits, and, and they're good people. And you can do that, but I don't think you can say there aren't it's horrible concrete, things in there. Concrete, you as a secular say one last thing, my attitude towards my future children, although I don't have my, I don't have any children now, will be very open. I will tell them, communicate to them what I believe in as a person, but I will never <coughs> force them. One day when they become other, I mean, I don't want to believe in whatever you believe in, I'll say it's up to you, it's your choice. All I did in my life is communicate information to you, and it's your choice. Fantastic. Um, can we keep question to the length of a question? Nice short <laughs> question to put it. At least we've got a lot of things to get through. Um, I'm going to pass over here now. This uh, one was direct to Keith. I wondered what your response was to Eric Pickle. So I've just written a back from uh, Andrew Smith. I wrote to him asking him to call for Pickle's resignation because <laughs> I think, and he's, he's obviously not going to do that, but he, he's, gonna, he's written to um, Eric Pickles. Uh, but basically, because to my mind, Pickles is using his position to privilege people of his religious beliefs, and he seems to see himself as sort of above the rule of law. Just wonder what you thought about it. Well, I have to say, I find that quite difficult to disagree with. Um, I mean, clearly, he's very evangelical, and he uh, is is determined uh, that uh, the uh, praying uh, will take place, be possible to take place in council meetings. Said very rude things about the court, uh, which I thought were were inappropriate, um, and. Um, I, I talked to some MPs uh, a few days ago, and I said I, I thought that Pickles would go further. There's an argument about whether the Localism Act does or does not uh, permit, uh, which, which obviously wasn't in force when, uh, when we went to court first, um, w w was in, w would in fact make praying possible. And, and he's brought forward this... Uh, th th this uh, law, so that it brought it into uh, to force from the beginning of uh, this week, I think. Um, and I said that I thought that uh, it was a pretty f facile argument uh, to decide whether that was true or not, uh, because uh, if that turned out not to be true, he would just pass another law uh, which was unambiguous. Um, and uh, the MPs said that that was really unthinkable that, uh, that the, the government would pass a law for a relative to, to uh, countermand a relatively small uh, court case. Lo and behold, they were wrong. He's actually said in a letter I've seen that he's written to every local authority in the country that that's exactly what he's going to do. Uh, so yes, I do agree with you. And what will I do? I'll see him in court. Thank you. Do you think it was uh, certainly not amongst the Christians, but uh, some Christians, but I think it'll be long, long term, it's an embarrassment, it will be an embarrassment. And I've been really encouraged by the extent to which uh, the, as I said, even the, the people responding in right-wing newspapers, by and large, have been on our side. So, um, yes, quite possibly, but the government can't see it. They are very, very pro-religion. I mean, we spent last year banging the education bill really hard on issues like collective worship. We're the only country in the world that has daily collective worship in its schools, uh, probably in the same way as we're the only country in the world to have the 26 bishops. Uh, and I, bet, I believe the two are connected. Uh, and uh, it, the, the government, however hard we argue, uh, and, and the, the, the bishops actually went to go and so the education secretary and said, my goodness, they're really putting up a big fight. And he said, don't worry, don't worry, I'll deal with it. And he did. And all of the arguments, however good they were, and even if, even if they were backed up by human rights and support from the Human Rights Select Committee, the European Directive, all that kind of thing, didn't care. Just to give the bishops what they want. And that's, I'm afraid, what the Conservative Party is doing. Well, uh, possibly not. That's why I lived there. Yes, That's I know. I was wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get as many questions in as possible this evening. Could just get back to tolerance again. Uh, do, do you think those religions that are generally uh, by nature proselytizing, you know, they, they don't accept 
other people's opinions if, if it's not, not their own, uh, the, the ones uh, are also automatically intolerant by nature. Yes, that was part of my memes argument, really. That's one of the ways they thrive, and that is, it's not the only way, but it's a way that does encourage intolerance. That's how they proselytize. We're better than you. No. Well, if, yeah, if not, we're not better than you. If you, if you don't believe, right. there's something wrong with you. And, that, and, that, and that, that's just pure intolerance. And so though, I, th I think there's a difference between those the religions. The proselytizing religions, religions will thrive in certain uh, social environments better than in others. And at the moment, because it, most religions have been passed on down generations, uh, now things are moving much faster. Proselytizing and going between the same generation is more effective. And I think nobody's done any studies of this, but I, I would like to see those done in a kind of ecological way, as you do in biology, to see which kind of religions thrive in, in which kind of niche. Fantastic. Um, Doesn't look somebody else want to answer that. Well, I'll add a very quick one. I mean, I think I'm trying to pick up the answer to that question in, in that um, there's a very interesting analysis of the census question in Scotland for 2001, which gave, which asked two questions, not just what religion are you, but what religion were you brought up in? Um, and, and it's not difficult to, uh, uh, to work out that uh, the stronger religions, that the, the more intolerant religions, appear to be ones that have the greatest grip. So, so for example, the Church of Scotland, which is relatively wishy-washy, which isn't a criticism, uh, is, um, it, 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 it loses members much, more, much quicker than, than, than the, the more uh, authoritarian religions. Can I just answer this from Islamic at least? Mm. Mm. Please. Um, no, it doesn't. And if, if I do feel that, then I would be like considering you all as my enemies in this, you know, well, context. Uh, you don't sound very typical. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, okay, from an Islamic point of view, okay, in fact, it encourages tolerance toward others. For instance, in the verse, chapter 45, uh, verse 14, you can check it, basically saying, you believers, be tolerant towards others and do not and, and do forgive them even if they harm you and leave their matters to God who will judge them on the day of judgment by the actions they've done. That's just an example. And what I'm trying to say well, if you need to I think I think we've had enough of the Islamic point of view for now. I'm just gonna take another question over here. Okay, um thank you then everybody because it's been a brilliant debate. Um, so I suspect your memes um, idea is absolutely right. It disturbs me, but I think you're right, and I think it makes some light me. Um, what I'd like to just kind of pick up on is this idea of religion and the, the wonderful things that the Quakers and the Buddhists have been saying um, has very little bearing on, on organised religion. Um, I can't talk about lots of other religions, because the only, my particular bet noir is the Catholic Church, which is the one I was brought up in. I can tell you a lot about that. And the whole point about the Catholic Church's existence is for the glorification of God. It doesn't see the individual person of any consequence whatsoever. Um, in fact, the catechism, which we all have to, to say um, piecemeal every morning, and I remember it, goodness me, who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? He made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and be happy with him forever in the next. Happiness wasn't a valid goal. The individual person is of no consequence, and that's the thing that organized religion has power over human beings. What you were talking about, and what you were talking about, is something totally different. What you were talking about is compassion uh, between human beings. But you have to also know that organized religion has no concern about human beings. That's a fact. And Buddhism, particularly, is something that I have studied um, and have great deal of respect for. And, but I don't see it as a religion. I see it more of a philosophy. And I think the Dalai Lama says the same, because I've read that book. So um, the reality is that the question for me is you have to change the idea that organized religion is about compassion and empathy. That's to do with human beings. And that transcends religion, in my opinion. Um, in terms of faith schools, I think, you know, I, I agree with you, they're appalling. Thanks. Uh, would anybody like to add to that? 
I'm going to let that go. I think we ought to move on to another question. Quick question on the way. Um, everybody, it's quite easy to hate on the Catholic Church, but I mean, individual Catholics, um, it'd be very unfair to treat individual Catholics. How about the Pope? One word answer. Would you sit down and have a cup of tea with the Pope? Yeah, great chance to argue with him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even, even with all the charge of sex abuse, you'd sit down with him? I hope I'd have the courage to argue with him. Yeah, I'm great with that. I'm not sure what I'd do with a cup of tea, but... <laughs> <laughs> I know I'd have the courage to argue with him. I don't think it's always going to be for help. No. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny that the last point about religion, you know, certain religions such as Buddhism, not actually being religions, um, being more philosophies, I was going to suggest the opposite, that perhaps religion is um, transformed since what it was in past times and um, you know, perhaps it started off with all these positive um, ideals, if you like, and through, you know, over time in the same way that everything changes, um, perhaps it's been poisoned in a way by men and, you know, people with agendas greed, all sorts, and that, the point that I wanted to make was perhaps we need to stop looking at it as religion, as the, as, as the, uh, the issue, and you know, the things behind the curtain, all these other different aspects of, the, you know, negative aspects of humanity which are portray, uh, portrayed through religion, and so we've come to build up this whole negative uh, perception of religion, when in, you know, in actual fact this there's all these other things which are going on and, and religion is just being used as, as a name, you know. Um, my, my, dad, my dad's a Muslim, my mum's a, a Christian. I haven't been brought up uh, with any religious uh, indoctrination. But um, my, dad, my dad said to me once, you know, people in the mosque ask him, where are his kids? Why don't they come to mosque? And he says, well, as long as they live, you know, virtuously, they live with the... Um, you know, the ideas, uh, the, the fundamental ideas which religion tries to, to instill in you, then they're Muslims, they don't have to pray that five times a day, they don't have to, um, you know, come to mosque. It, it, it's the, the kind of, the core, the philosophy behind it. Um, would you agree that it's, sorry, would you agree that it's, um, you know, as the previous speaker suggested, that the, the, these religions like Buddhism are more of philosophies or the other way around, you know, it, religion is... Um... Alison? Uh, yeah, um, I read a really interesting article once in an aeroplane magazine, and I always wished I kept it, because I quoted it for 10, 20 years, it's kind of stuck in your mind. And I'm, somebody can probably tell me what the origin of it was, but it was basically saying that there's different strands involved in each religion. So you would have, for example, the very moralistic strand, very interested in how it interacts in society, the practical stuff and whatever. You see, I'm not so strong on personally. You'd have the devotional strand, people who got a lot out of rituals and found that really helpful. And you'd have the Gnostic strand, which is the one that I've always been more interested in, which is where you're doing the kind of personal solitary work, the self-transformational kind of work. And that actually people from those different strands might have more in common with each other across religions than you would do in vertical mm -hmm. religions. My husband's a practicing Christian. In fact, he runs a Center for Reconciliation and, and Peace in London, which is, which is within the church. He's extremely embarrassed by some of his bedfellows. You know, I mean, it's indefensible, some of the stuff that's happening under that <coughs> big label. But it's all, as you said, it's, it's a very, very complex thing. And, I mean, I'm, you know, so shocked by what's happened within the Catholic Church, as I'm sure it's everybody here. And I was just wondering whether to say anything in return, but I worked for a, a year in a Roman Catholic Irish community in West London. It was one of the most compassionate and loving communities I've ever come across. The priests were fantastic, women were fantastic. I was very, very involved with them, so I know I wasn't just stuck in the veneer. I was developing a project for homeless people within that community. You know, and I've, I've met incredible, incredible Roman Catholic priests. I've met amazing people from all different faith traditions and, and worked with them. So I find the generalizations very, very difficult. They're easy to do. But I think we need to go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. I, I disagree with you in the sense that I think one can blame the religions, but the religions are piggybacking on human nature. So I agree with you to the extent that yeah, it's about greed and power and egotism and fear and a whole lot of human things. 
But religions <coughs> as mean plexes, as organized <coughs> groups of ideas, allow some of those things to thrive. And the more organized they get, and the more institutionalized they get, the, the, the more people with those natures are, are sucked into and the, them and, and encouraged. And the extra point you could make onto that is, in becoming those mean plexes, which I think is very hard to argue with, you know, it's a really interesting, strong hypothesis, are they then actually losing the identifying characteristics of being a religious? Yes, religious yeah, it's a good point. Yes. yes. Quite. And, and, as, as the man was saying, well, Jesus yeah, started... recognised some of the stuff yeah, that's no. going on. Like, <coughs> we our house isn't completely clean. Would the Buddha have recognised some of the stuff? Would the Buddha have recognised some of the stuff? Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly agree with that point, which is interesting to see it echoing around the hall about how there's often much more in common between the liberals of, of all the different religions and simply no doubt the, the, uh, the illiberals as well. Um, and, and I hope the more work can be done in perhaps inter, interfaith reconciliation along those sort of lines. And to a degree, I think it already does. Um, I, I know that. Uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Ramey um, uh, is involved with, with work with Muslims and uh, he's a very liberal uh, Jew that I have immense respect for. Um, but as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, I'm, obviously I'm, I'm sure I have no comment to, to make about what happened in West London, but um, I, I did a report for the uh, Council of Europe about child abuse in Ireland. Uh, it was a 50-page report just taking from all the different reports going back probably about 50 years even. That's quite shocking that I could actually find problems going back that far. And some really hard-nosed people came to me and said that, and not just what, came to me and said that they read my report and it had reduced them to tears. And you would have to be a very, very stony person, hearted person, not to have that, and it was about basically the, the breakdown of uh, <coughs> total breakdown and cruelty uh, in, in Ireland by all parts, large parts of the Catholic Church. And I have to say, I hope without a smile from you, that it was actually the absence of secularism that contributed to that, because one of the big problems was that it was the state failed in its duty. <coughs> To look after these kids, to, to look after the schools where, where that they had given over to the Catholic Church to, to run, um, and, and they were frightened of actually uh, uh, of, uh, disciplining the, the people in the schools or telling the bishops what to do and to stop doing what they were doing. Um, and it was that secular breakdown that was the final straw in, in that terrible performance going on for uh, <coughs> these 50 years. And some people say 1,500 years. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to take one question. It has to be short. If you have to promise it's going to be short. Um, and it was pointed out beforehand. So. It's fairly short. It's going to be short. Uh, I want to thank Alison for uh, doing that little short meditative breathing at the beginning of her talk. I definitely need to do that today. Uh, I think my question is that I think that sort of um, practice is very important. I'm a humanist and atheist myself, but I meditate and it's transform the way I think and transform the way I live in life and it's improved me vastly and I push everyone else to do it. Um, and I think religions do do this a lot more than those <coughs> previous atheist traditions do. And I just want to ask both you two um, whether you think this sort of thing is important <coughs> and whether or not we should make an effort to make sure everyone tries to do this sort of thing, not necessarily impose it like religions do. But I do think it's important, but I think there are awful tensions that drag it away. If you take meditation, um, uh, maybe you wouldn't, but I, I would, as something where you can calm down, clear the mind, become closer to who you are deep down and not all the things that you think you are, uh, closer to how looking at the world with, with fresh eyes. This has no um, uh, necessary connection with religion but nor does it have a connection with other things that drag it away. So on the one hand, we've talked about how practices like that are co-opted by religion, not <coughs> in the contemplative traditions where they tend to stay with it, but in the kind of you know organized religion um, aspect of it. But what we're seeing sadly now, for example, with mindfulness, mindfulness has gone from being a basic fundamental process like that to being, you can be more relaxed, you can achieve your goals in life, you can fulfill all your dreams by mindfulness, and it's getting dragged off into a, a materialistic end. So, you know, it's another, so it's difficult. Yes, 
Let, I think meditation would be helpful to probably everybody, but those are the dangers. Fantastic. I have a feeling we know what Alison's going to say on meditation, so I was going to ask um, Michael and Keith, do you have any opinions on meditation? Um, I think one of the things that's been wonderful here is to see how many different perspectives there are and different types of spirituality, whether or not parts of organised and institutional religion. I think probably that I also really value that opportunity that Alison gave us. And I think my question for us all is to try and listen to that which is most deeply and, and truly loving in, in ourselves, really, and be kind to ourselves as well, maybe. Cool. I quite like to end on that. So, um, oh, well, I didn't get my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have something nice to say? I'm <laughs> 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 not quite sure how to put that. Well, we all have different uh, ways of looking at these things, and what my way is is I'm passionate about <coughs> classical music, and that's what does it for me. And, and my bit of transcendental, or whatever, transcendence, uh, comes out of that, and, and just uh, just one. Can I have a fifteen minute, a fifteen second? <laughs> <laughs> fifteen second, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that if any of you are interested in in being better informed about a lot of these issues, the NSS has a weekly newsletter that is hugely popular. It's called Newsline. If you go onto the website, it costs nothing, of course, and we scour the world each week for. Uh, for material of interest, and if you want to look at that, so you may find it uh, worthwhile. A lot of people do. Thank you. Um, we covered a lot this evening. I just wonder if each speaker would like to take 15 seconds to tell us about something they've learned from the evening. <laughs> or do you think the rest of us have learned? Have you taught us something in life? <laughs> well, 15 seconds. Any sort of summary whatsoever. I think I'm too tired. Can I give my 15 seconds to somebody else? <laughs> I'm sure I've learned lots, but I can't condense it into anything. Well, I, I think my respect for the Quakers has grown, and uh, I found that very, uh, very interesting, and also, I think, shows how religion doesn't have to be institutional bullying and the more there is of people who follow religions like uh, like Quakerism the, the better for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, um, all of our speakers have won a highly coveted Think Week t-shirt. Yeah. Um, <laughs>